Hello and welcome to Data Diversity Talks, a podcast where we discuss with industry leaders and experts how they have built their careers around data. I'm your host, Shannon Kemp, and today we're talking to Data.World's principal scientist, Juan Cicada, and the vice president of product, Tim Gasper, about their careers in data. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer of Dataversity and this is My Career in Data, a Dataversity Talks podcast dedicated to learning from those who have careers in data management to understand how they got there and to be talking with people who help to make those career careers a little bit easier. To keep up to date in the latest in data management education, go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Today we are joined by two gentlemen from data.world, Tim Gasper and Juan Cicada. And normally this is where a podcast host would read a short bio of the guests. But in this podcast, it's your bio that we're here to talk about. So Tim and Juan, hello and welcome. Hey, thanks so much for having us. We're so excited to be part of the show. Yes, same thing. This is uh, great to be here. So excited you guys are here. Again, you guys are always been so great in our webinars and you're so enthusiastic and so much energy. I'm really excited to have you guys here to join us today and talk about um, how you got into data management. So let's start with that. You know, start with what's your current job title and what do you currently do, Juan? Let's start with you. So my title is principal scientist at data.world. And I still ask myself, what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, well, first of all, I, always, I say I carry two hats. So I carry my, I'm an academic, I'm a scientist by training. So I, I carry my academic scientific hat always, but I'm also kind of my, the business engineering hat. So it's a combination of two things that I do. Uh, at data.world specifically, I kind of spent time in all the different main pillars of the company. I was actually telling Tim yesterday, like yesterday was a day that I spent a little bit of every day, every piece of the day. Sales, I started off the day at a sales call uh, through some leads that came through me and I was helping out with an account executive on a sales call. Uh, then I spent some time with marketing because I've helped generate some content. Uh, we, we write a lot of blog posts, the podcast that we do is part of the marketing, uh, going off to some new things that we're, being, that we're writing. I spent time with customers. So yesterday I had a one-on-one -on -one with one of our uh, VPs of data analytics and one of our customers to understand, hey, we have monthly check-ins. Hey, what are you doing? How's it going? What are you thinking about? data what's up and i share also kind of where my thoughts are and, and see where we're how we can advance and then also on product and engineering so i always like to have ways to how can we push our product to the next level uh and, and figure out all those things that i'm learning about hey we should be doing this new thing like how can we push data that world as an enterprise data catalog for the modern data stack like maybe we can start doing these new types of things so that was an example yesterday of the four things. And then even, if, even with my academic hat on, I'm, I'm chairing the web conference in Austin next year. So we had our big academic uh, kind of organizing committee meeting. So that's kind of a, a, a day. And, and if it were, <laughs> if it were when, yesterday was Wednesday, and if it were, uh, well, we're in session with our podcast, we would have even done our podcast. So <laughs> yeah. well, we're, we're taking a, we're taking we're a, taking a, summer, a break right summer break right now. So <laughs> that's what I do. So it's like, I, I, to summarize, I'm, I'm a very, like I'm T-shaped, so I do very general, a lot of things, and then I have my very specific T, which is focusing on anything around knowledge graphs. I love it. And Tim, I, I'm going to ask you the same question, but let me back up a little bit too. You know, um, as one, you were talking, you know, see, so both of you work for data.world, which is, as you mentioned, a data catalog. So, uh, so you're a, did, it's a vendor per se. So what is data.world before we get into, Tim, what your title is? Yeah, sure. So maybe I'll start off and, and Juan, if you want to add. So uh, Data.World is a, uh, a company, a software company focused on providing a data catalog and governance solution fully hosted in the cloud um, to help companies to find, understand, trust and access their data. Um, so a bunch of different companies work with us. Uh, we were recently announced a, a leader in the uh, uh, Forrester quadrant for data catalogs for data ops. Nice. Um, and in general, just helping companies really keep track of their data, organize it. And uh, in addition to enterprise, we also have a really huge open data community where millions of people are there uh, working with, you know, open data sets around COVID, around policing in America and various other things uh, in that open data community. So, uh, and lots of other stuff, but those are some of the big things that Data.World works on. 
I love it. Juan, anything you want to add to that? No, Tim. <laughs> He's got it down. <laughs> <laughs> so Tim, then um, what is your title and what do you do? Yeah, so sure. So um, I'm the VP of product at Data.World. So um, uh, one of the most fun things I get to do is every Wednesday, get to do our catalog and cocktails podcast with Juan. Uh, so that's always uh, our big highlight. A highlight. Uh, also uh, joining the Dataversity uh, uh, webinars and things like that is always uh, an absolute pleasure uh, to work with you and, and others, Shannon. Um, but also, uh, so at Data.World, I manage our product, so our product strategy, our roadmap, um, our program management as well. Uh, but what's also exciting about my role at Data.World is I also run our data team. So our data engineers, our analytics engineers, um, all reporting to me. And so in that uh, sense, uh, I don't get just to do sort of software product management, but also data product, ma uh, data product management as well. All right, so the big question here and the big build up. So how did you get to be where you are today? You know, um, is, this, is this what you wanted to be when you grew up? Like, where did you want to be when you, when you were little? Is this, how did, and how did you get from there to here? Juan, you always wanted to work at a data catalog company, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, when so, I, when that's I, when a big I, dream. When I was a kid, I said, when I grew up, I want to work at a data catalog company. <laughs> Said <laughs> <Bad>, no one. <laughs> I was joking to Juan the other day. I was like, I, I think I figured out what a data catalog was like four years ago. <laughs> so obviously now, you know, we're experts at it, but like it's uh, it, it's different, right? It's not right. it's not what everyone thinks of, and uh, and even data in general is often not what people think about when when they're younger, right? Like you're six years right. old, you're like, I want to be a data scientist. Not 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 usually, right? Um, <laughs> So, uh, I don't uh, know, like, yeah. Juan, do you want to start us off? And oh, then maybe I'll well, give okay, some so of my story. My, my, my kid answer is I, I wanted to be a, a police officer. I think that was when I was I love kid. it. So yeah. I was gonna, um, but so I come from, uh, I come from a family of academics. Uh, mm. So kind of I, 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 science has always been kind of what I grew up. Um, my, my, my mom is more kind of on the a human education side. My father is on the on on the hardware side. So my father was a material is a material scientist. Um, they both work for IBM and stuff. So I kind of grew up around ah, awesome. IBM. IBM means I've been moved. So I was I was born in San Jose, California, when the Silicon Valley was about silicon. Um, so um, so I grew around technology all the time. So I I, I got into computer science very early on, but um, I think it was it was. When I started in my undergrad, I was, uh, my parents are Colombian and I grew up in Colombia uh, when I was like, after the age of 10, I moved to Colombia and think I was around, I was probably, I don't know, 18, 19, a professor came to the university to, to give a talk on something called semantic web. I think this was like 2004. Yeah. 2004. And I found that fascinating. And, the, and the, what I found fascinating was the issue about semantics, and that was, I mean, realized that oh, you can, you can say one word can mean multiple things, right? So the example I've come up with is like, oh, if you search on the web, right? Think about Google, early Google, right? Two thousand four is like you search for the web and you search for Paris Hilton. So you are you thinking about the person, or are you thinking a place? And you're thinking about right. a ho a ho is it a hotel Hilton in Paris and which city Paris and so forth. And that got me like, oh, there's all these things about semantics and knowledge. And then I started reading a lot about ontologies and knowledge representation. <laughs> and, and that's what really got me started. I think so from early, very early on, I think literally when I was I mean, second year in undergrad, I was in Columbia doing this. Yeah. Uh, I got into semantics uh, and doing, getting to data and integrating data and stuff like that. Um, and, and then I, I, I transferred and I, but my, we all moved back to the U.S. and I, I, I did my undergrad, I transferred my undergrad to at UT Austin in computer science. And what was funny was that a little kind of a little side thing happened was that I, I was into data and doing software application stuff and I met some folks from Switzerland and uh, we started kind of a company together. I had an engineering team in Colombia. The company was uh, based out of Switzerland. So I did that for a couple of years. We're just doing a web 2.0, nice app for project management system. I remember project management system for temporal staff companies. 
uh, company still exists. It's actually doing pretty well. Um, wow. But uh, at that point, I was like, so I had that entrepreneur spirit that comes from my, from my, from my mother, uh, but the science comes from my dad, yeah. let's say, uh, more. Um, and then I got into the, I started, was so excited about research. I was doing undergraduate research. I met uh, a professor who became my advisor, which was uh, Dan Moranker. And from there, um, I said, I like this research that I'm doing on semantics. And what I was doing was understanding the relationship between relational databases and the semantic web technologies. It was around 2005, 2006 now. Um, and then I said, hey, I like this research. I like Austin. I like the professor I'm working with. I want to keep doing this stuff. So the uh, an answer was, go do your go apply for a PhD. So I, I only applied for a PhD at UT uh, because I wanted to do all these things. And I said, if I don't get in, I'll just go to Switzerland to do my other company or otherwise I'll do my PhD. And I got in. So I stayed to do my PhD. And that question that Dan Moranker asked me back in 2006 was, what's the relationship between relational databases and the semantic web? And that question changed my life. And that continues to be the pursuit that I have today. Uh, it's, did my PhD, developed a lot of the theory and the systems behind it. A lot of that was uh, became standards from W3C, uh, the relational database to RDF mapping the standards. Started a company out of that. Uh, just because, this, it, I mean, I was so interested of like, hey, if, people, if, if the future is going to be semantics, 2000, now 2008, nine, right? People yeah. want to say, well, my data is in Oracle and SQL Server. Like, how do I put these two things together? And, and effectively around 2012 or 2011, uh, people are starting to knock on our door about that stuff. I remember going to Dataversity, what was it, Semtech Biz? I mean, 2000, yeah. 2008, 2009. I'd say, yeah. I think, I always say, I think I was the youngest person going to that conference. <laughs> 21, barely going to it. Um, and yeah, we were, I was giving talks, tutorials about linked data and all this stuff over there. Uh, and then I uh, started doing the company and uh, data.world. I've known data World folks for a long time. and kind of very, very aligned on mission and vision. And I sold the company data world and that was around 2019. And uh, you joined what, like three, three months after I did kind of thing. And exactly. So, yeah. Exactly. So that was when data world started uh, focusing on enterprise and uh, they we were a customer, they're interested in the IP and uh, here I am. Well, just to kind of close this around a data, yeah. what is the relationship between data catalog and knowledge graphs? Well, hey, knowledge graphs are all about integrating knowledge and data at scale. And a data catalog is about integrating a lot of this metadata that comes yeah. from the open sources. So data.world is really a knowledge graph management system where the data catalog is your first app on that, right? And then that's all the integration that we do. And that's a very long, but quick story of, of <laughs> what I want. Well, I think I, I think I want more. You said what I wanted to grow up. And then I kind of answer like, what am I, how did I get here? But yeah, no, it's perfect. No, it's, it's really perfect. And, you know, although it's a big jump from um, police officer to, uh, <laughs> to, to where the you are now. knowledge scientist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it was a pretty clear path once you got into college. It sounded like you just had some really, a couple of key moments that just pushed you forward and you were already immersed in this technology um, and uh, it, it's very, very interesting. So Tim, was your path as, as straightforward? What do you want to be when you grew up? What, what was I, your... I, I, you know, I took a very different path than Juan yeah. did, but yeah. like, I think what's interesting, what's similar is that we both took very sort of interesting paths, right? We had, we had our own sort of snaking path, right? Yeah. Um, and for me, uh, when I was young, I actually wanted to be uh, a cameraman for a while. I always oh, thought that like it. film was so yeah. cool. And like, I didn't want to be the director because that uh -huh. person had to do like lots of managing people and stuff like that. I wanted to be the camera guy because I love it. Camera. Yeah. Um, and then I wanted to be an astronaut and then a physicist <laughs> and actually went oh. to college looking to do physics. Um, but I found that I um, enjoyed technology, but I hated math. Um, <laughs> and, 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 uh, and I really liked business, right? And so um, I found that sort of where I could get my math fix, but do sort of uh, it in, in an easier way where I didn't have to do like, you know, labs and, you know, do more complex research and things like that while also getting a business fix is actually started a data company. Um, so my senior year in college, I started a company called Keepstream, uh, which I actually only have one t-shirt left. So um, I have it framed uh, behind me uh, when I do uh, videos and things like that. Uh, it's my last shirt. Um, and uh, Keepstream was a social media analytics company. 
Um, and so um, we basically uh, started the company at a similar time to when like Facebook and, and Twitter and then things like Foursquare were starting to get really popular. And a lot of brands were trying to understand like, oh, what is the impact of us like hosting a South by Southwest party? Like what, like what is like how many influencers are tweeting about us and things like that, right? And so me and my two co-founders, we basically were like combination business people, data scientists. We uh, were doing things super lean style. And so we basically hand analyzed the data. Uh, and then handed it to PR people to validate, like, do you like this? Is this what you want? Right. And they were like, yeah, this is what we want. We we're like, oh, cool. We should code this. Right. Uh, and that was essentially how we built out that company. Um, and uh, so at this point, I hadn't done product management. I was sort of accidentally getting into data. Uh, and then our startup ended up getting bought by another data company called InfoChimps, which is the other frame that I have behind me. Uh, and InfoChimps was uh, uh, big in sort of like uh, 2009, 2010, mm -hmm. um, startup in Austin, uh, really was going for creating uh, a data marketplace and, and being able to let people sort of buy and sell and find data across the world. Um, interestingly, uh, fast forward 10 years later, you see a, a, a kind of a similar mission with data.world, right? Um, and uh, and uh, there um, I uh, came on as a product manager because they didn't really know where else I was going to go. They were like, well, there's this guy who knows business and knows data. What's he going to do? Maybe he's a product manager. Um, the head of product left at InfoChimps, and then I ended up taking on sort of the head of product role. And then I've been in various places since then working at like a startup called Bitfusion, uh, which was all around GPU acceleration for deep learning applications. Um, I worked at a company called JanRain that was focused around customer identities. Like how do we analyze customer identity to do more effective marketing, but also how do we protect those identities to make sure that they're safe? Um, uh, I was at Rackspace for a while. Um, and then also, you know, most recently uh, at data.world uh, where we're doing catalog and governance. With a robust catalog of courses offered on demand and industry-leading live online sessions throughout the year, the Dataversity Training Center is your launchpad for career success. Browse the complete catalog at training.dataversity.net and use code DVTALKS for 20% off your purchase. That's really impressive. So both of you, just big entrepreneurs, um, self-starters, go-getters. I, obviously, data world is is uh, hiring some and inquiring some great uh, people there. Um, uh, did you all do always? Um, were you always self starters? Just like you always, just out trying new things, even as kids. Just I'm gonna go start something. I, I think so. Uh, yeah. Like for, for me personally, it, it didn't start as like starting businesses per se. That was a little bit later, yeah. but I was always like um, overly proactive, right? Yeah. So like, uh, like if there was an opportunity to join a club and I thought that club was interesting, I was not keeping track of the fact that I was in eight clubs or nine clubs. I was like, well, that's interesting. I want to be a part of that. Uh -huh. uh, and so, you know, it didn't start off as business, but it did start off as just like trying to be involved in as much as possible. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. So for, me, for me, it's been around uh, just be excited to try something different and, and, and get outside of your comfort zone uh, mm -hmm. to, to, to some point. Um, I mean, I guess we, as a kid, I moved, we moved to Colombia, right? This is, uh, my, my parents are Colombian and the Colombian government was looking for just like scientists to move back to their country. Uh, I, did a, I, I did my exchange year, my last year of high school in Switzerland to go learn German. I didn't know anything. I didn't know German, I went there. I mean, I was, the only real job I've had, when I mean a real job, like uh, I actually looked, signed up, I mean, had an interview and stuff was to be a camp counselor. <laughs> 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 that. That's like the old, I got a, that's how I got my first laptop. I actually it was the money I made on a camp, but, but I just like nice. I, 2003, four, something like that. And I just kind of found something online and they, they made an interview and they're like, all right, yep, we come over here and fly to Baltimore. I'm like, I've never been to Baltimore. I'm like, who's going to pick me up when I get there? Right? Just, <laughs> no, I mean, just stuff like that. Right. So uh, I've enjoyed travel going to a lot of different places. So I think it's just kind of, uh, being open uh, to, to, to writing things. I, I, I would say is the, the main thing I learned in my PhD, there's actually two things. One is to be comfortable in a sea of ambiguity, to be dumped into blah yeah. and say, okay, I'll go figure it out. 
I'm, I'm right. I, I got my techniques, right? I know how to tread water. I know how to right? I know how to go figure out where the sun is, or, or and then that's how I can figure out the north. Like you know, I just feel comfortable being dumped into a sea of blah. Uh, and then after that, you kind of like figure out what is is there even a problem here? You know, and then you learn the second thing is communication, how to communicate what you've learned to other people, uh, written and orally. And after that, you're probably pretty smart. You'll come up with a great solution, a great whatever, and then. Coming up with that right idea is, I think, afterwards, but being comfortable with the ambiguity and communication. I, I think that's interesting what Juan is saying because, you know, communication and comfort with ambiguity, like both of these things actually, you, you find that whether it's entrepreneurship or it's product management or it's working with data or semantics, like all three of those things end up you benefiting if you can build these skills around communication and around this sort of comfort with ambiguity, jumping in with a problem solving mindset. It's a, it's interesting that there's a thread that kind of ties all these things together. Yeah, very much so. And I think it's uh, very inspiring uh, and hope it encourages people to explore new things. Um, that's how we make progress, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So tell me this. So what, um, so we're getting, talking about careers and data. What is your definition of data? What is data? Tim, you oh, that's, start? <laughs> that's, that's interesting. That's an interesting question. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start this off. And I'm, I'm curious how different or same my definition is going to be with Juan. So um, I, I think that data is observations and facts um, that are being generated by sometimes machines and sometimes humans. Um, and these observations and facts, sometimes they're insightful on their own, right? But very often they need work to be insightful, right? They need to be transformed. It needs to be combined. It needs to be contextualized. It needs to be captured often in the first place, right? Before we can actually turn it into something that's actionable and useful. And, you know, uh, we, we use this phrase at data.world, actionable knowledge, right? How do you turn data into actionable knowledge? And a lot of times data is not actionable and it is not knowledge all on its own and there, there's work you have to do to, to get it there so uh, that, that's kind of my definition of, of data sort of observations and facts kind of broad yeah i, I mean that that's my definition too like i would say that i think the dictionary definition of data is like it's facts right or observations and facts i would take it next is like it's it's the it's what exists it's the let me get, get a little philosophical here it's Think about it. It's like it's what I can touch. It's the matter of things, right? If I can, uh, but that's one thing is what I can look at, what I can touch is those facts that I can observe. But then there's something else, which is like the things that I can't touch. It's the intangible, and I think that for me, that's the other aspect. We don't talk that much, but we need to go talk more. Is about the knowledge. So this is the separation that for me, the data is like the matter and the the, the material. And the knowledge, which we can't touch, that's the immaterial. And these are two things that by themselves are great, but it's better if they're tied together. Sure. And I think that is the quest of, I would say that the, a, a, a quest of computer science, of technology in general, is to be able to combine data and knowledge together. It's to be able to combine that material and that immaterial. Uh, and, and once you combine that, that's when you start generating actions, insights, and all these things. So the example I always say is like, okay, 10, or, or let's do 42, right? Okay, what, what can I tell you about that? By, by the equivalent of the laws of physics, which is the laws of math, right? It's a number. It's a positive number. It's a natural number. Okay, that's the, the, that's the, the laws of, of math tell me this. So what? What do I do with that? Well, what if I tell you next to 42, I put some, some letters that says USD. Oh, okay. So I gave it an interpretation. So that's a string. What does that mean? Okay. But what if I put now a column on top and I call on, on top of 42, I put something that says price. And then another column next to it says currency. Oh, okay. So this means it's something that you paid for, and it's in, uh, it's it's in a, in its money, right? What do you bought? What or did you pay for something or you received money? Then you start getting into more of the, the that that's the immaterial stuff. The forty-two is what I saw written down, and USD is what I saw written down, right? 
And I think those are the two connections that we need to start doing more. So actually, so my whole point is that we talk so much about data, we need to start talking more about knowledge that in material stuff and connect them together. So data in context. The, and yep. data. Uh, so, you know, and at 42 is also, you know, the life, the answer to life, the universe and everything, right? <laughs> A very good number to choose. <laughs> at least according to Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, right? <laughs> Douglas <laughs> Adams. <laughs> um, so let me ask you this. Do you see the importance of data management and the number of jobs working with data increasing or decreasing over the next 10 years and why? Do you want to go first, Juan, or should I? Um, you go first. <laughs> yeah, all right. I, want to, I want to come up with a controversial answer. Uh, all right, Paul. So whatever I say, then you can say the opposite right now. We'll say maybe. Uh, <laughs> I, don't know. Um, I, I think the number of data jobs, but also people who have sort of the skills and things like that. So I'm not sure exactly does that net out to, you know, there's going to be a skills gap, I think probably in the short term, but um, uh, I think it's going to go up like quite significantly data jobs. Um, yeah. And and the, the reason why I say that is because I, I, I believe strongly at my core that, you know, se several years ago, there was this saying that a lot of leaders started to say, which is like, oh, every company is a software company, right? You need developers, you need to get good at technology, because, you know, every company needs to be able to build apps and, you know, make technology, it's differentiator. And that's how you're going to, you know, stay in front of the competition and make more money and save money, right? Now, fast forward to today, like maybe that was true, right? Maybe it was a little overhyped. But like today, I think what is very much becoming true is like cross out the word software, replace it with the word data. Like every company is a data company. And yeah. if you are not a data company, if you're not in command of your data, using your data effectively, you are not going to be able to properly compete, properly make the amount of money that you need to save the amount of money that you need to, and you need it to be your core competency. And so I think this is going to be a huge driver um, for every company as, as a percentage of the company, right? If you have a, th a thousand employees and only five of them are data people today, right? That number is going to go up. The percentage of companies that will be data people will go up. And so I think that's just going to trickle into all aspects of sort of the, the job landscape. Ella? So, um, <laughs> will the number of jobs increase in the next 10 years? Yes, but I don't think it should. Oh, all right. So the um, controversy, I love it. Okay, so uh, hear me out. I'm going to play the play this here. Um, first of all, the amount of questions that people will be asking will always go will be increasing, and the amount of people who will be asking those questions are are going to be increasing. They're always kind of on the business side, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think if, if right now we're we can't expect that for the, the to be like a linear growth or in these things. So we can't expect like, oh, it's almost a one-to-one, -one, right? Pairing around this, a linear parent. We really need to make sure that we can go scale the amount of questions and insights that we need to go generate. We don't need to have the same type, of, like have an increasing number of people all the time. We need to be able to go answer more and more questions with probably a smaller grounded group of, 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 of data folks. I think that's how we're really going to go scale. Uh, and, and companies who are able to go figure that out are going to be much more successful than the ones who are like, oh, we can figure it out, but we just need to bring in more people to go do the job, right? So I think that that's kind of an argument why I think we yeah, sure. shouldn't, it shouldn't have to go uh, increase. But what I do think needs to increase, and it goes back to my, my previous soapbox here, is uh, knowledge. And I think we need to increase knowledge because I think the knowledge aspects is what's going to give us the scale. I've, I mean, I've, I've been, I mean, Tim and I talk about this a lot and I've been really, really pushing this on kind of all my social media is we live in a data first world, which is give me more data, give me more data, more data, more data. I need more data and, 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 uh, and the data, more data is going to solve my problems. And right. So yes, we need the means that we have more people to go manage the data more data science, all these people to go do things with the data. And I'm like, but wait, um, you're really telling me that you're not able to go answer this question because you lack data. So if I give you more data, you're gonna be able to go answer these questions. I call BS on that. <laughs> yeah. Because that's exactly, I mean, again, yeah. this is insanity, right? We've been doing this over and over again and expecting different results. That's Einstein's definition of insanity. And I, I, now, now this is a data diversity podcast. I, I hopefully can, I can finally answer this question. I think it was at a data diversity conference that I saw somebody give a keynote and they made this joke, said, we can take a rocket to space, we can bring it back to earth, 
it can land on a platform in the middle of the ocean, but I still can't say that these two spreadsheets match. <laughs> yeah. So anybody from Data University hearing this can tell me who actually said this joke. I think it was at it was Data University conference. Please let me know. I've been trying to track yeah. the person for so long. So this is this this is crazy. I mean, we could argue that rocket science is probably easier than data. Because yeah. I mean, and probably it is because I think rocket science, it's physics, and these are the natural world. We can explain these things, and data is a lot of people, right? And I think that's just that people don't agree on what these things are. So working more with the people is the kind of the paradigm shift that we need to go do. And this is a shift that we think a paradigm shift from a data first world to what I'm calling a knowledge first world, which is people first, what you said before, context first, relationships first. And we need to start thinking about those types of roles, which might not be 100% data. I think it's going to be more on the knowledge side. So that's kind of my, my, my long winded answer to say, yeah, data will increase. I think it shouldn't because we need to be able to go figure out how to go scale businesses where you don't need to increase data people. Yeah. But to get there, we, what, we need to be able to go scale. I think we need to start focusing more on the knowledge side. So I would say, knowledge management kind of i mean broadly using that word because today knowledge management is more like content content and text and stuff like that it's more about like really understanding the meaning of data and the people right people context relationships i think that's the stuff that we should go focusing on and which by the way we were starting to go do this in the 90s all the expert systems we were doing now we had knowledge engineers right i think we just need to kind of take that on the way some of that lost art that was happening in the 90s and bring that back today and kind of upgrade that. So knowledge engineering 2.0, something that I call the knowledge scientists. And these are the folks who are like, who, who know who are the translators, right? They're in the middle between the producers sure. and consumers. I think I, that's going to increase. I think we see that pendulum swinging a little bit though, right? Like where I, I think, you know, when the deep learning craze kind of happened, that was, I think you, you saw that pendulum swing in a certain direction, which was like, I'm going to throw a bunch of compute at a bunch of data. And like, it's going to figure out that like these images are ostriches, right? It's like, oh, how did it know that? Well, uh, you know, because it was labeled, right? Um, right. So, uh, but now I think that we see that pendulum swing in the other way now. And like, let's just pick on like the, an the role of the analytics engineer which didn't really exist two years ago, right? Sure. I mean, yes, you can say that an analytics engineer is wrangling data and things like that, but a lot of what they're doing is actually trying to take the data as it comes into the lake or the warehouse and turn it into contextually meaningful structures and metrics that then can be analyzed by the business used in BI tools, data science tools. And so uh, I, I do think that what you're saying, Juan, is, is spot on. And But what, like, what we'll see is that, yeah, there's going to be more data people. And the companies that are going to be successful with those more data people are, are, are going to be the ones who aren't just like throwing spaghetti at the wall. It's the ones that are being serious about knowledge. They're being intentional with their data. Does that mean more data architects and modelers uh, to, to set up the data for the rest of the business? I would say we're going to, we need more data modeling, mm -hmm. but that needs to be very well connected with the business. So mm -hmm. I think that's, a, that's, a, that, that's kind of the difference here is that we need to make sure that these roles are tied to the, to, to the business. I think on the, this, the, the whole data mesh, like it or not the word, put that yeah. word aside, what is important, I think right now is this balance, finding the balance between centralization and decentralization that works best for your organization, your culture, your business. And part of that is saying, who wants to take uh, accountability, ownership, uh, be the ambassador for the, for the domain and the data within that domain. And that means I need to go under, understand what that means. So that's number one. And I think second is the other part is treating data as a product. And I think the way when you start treating data as a product, that literally for me means it's the same way you go buy something on Amazon. You go yeah. into Amazon because you have an intention, you put some search terms, whatever, you find a bunch of products, it's all ranked. I mean, and you click on the ones, which one's the one that has the highest ratings, right? You click on that one, you look at all the, all the descriptions around it, it gives you comparisons with other things, who bought this thing with the other thing. You never yeah. have to go talk to anybody. You bought something because you got all that context for you right there. That context, all that, that's the knowledge. It's not just the raw data, the table, the column, whatever. No, it's all that context. And how do you get that? You 
Somebody had to get the requirements. We're building this product because there's a particular consumer who has this need. This product may work for Shannon, but it may not work for Tim because there are two different types of markets of people. Like that's the type of somebody think about data. And we do this by talking to people. So I right. think that's that's the knowledge. I think another type of role comes in the data, the, I think the data product manager types of roles of just really it's the data, the data developer teams, right? I think that's where we're gonna go start seeing. I like it. Yeah. And it might it might be an architect, it might be a modeler, right? But it's kind of like the tale of two architects, right? There's the architect who's <laughs> like, I love Kimball Ross because that's the way that we can structure the data that is more performant and yada yada, right? And then there's right. the architect who's like, I went and spent, you know, 10 hours with the business last week to help to under to understand what's the difference between customer, active customer, current active customer, like, yeah. you know, and and ideally. Like if, if you can do both of those things well, right, then you're going to be uh, really effective at being sort of this knowledge translator. I love it. I hear Bob Steiner in my head. Just, we have to define, <laughs> define, assign data. Yeah. <laughs> Are you looking to learn how to implement a successful analytics strategy? Join us on October 19th for six live expert-led sessions at Enterprise Analytics Online. Register for free at eanalyticsonline.com. All right. So, you know, and I, by the way, one, I think it was Michael Stonebreaker who made that joke. I think it was that keynote, if I remember correctly. Oh, I'm seeing him in a couple of weeks. I will confirm. <laughs> i'll have to go back and look at the recording <laughs> you really badly want to know who to quote like what name to put under that huh? years i've been saying this for years oh, probably yeah. Five years yeah i think it's i think it's i think if i remember correctly i could be wrong but i'm, I'm pretty sure it was michael stonebreaker but um but i can look at the recording <laughs> i love that <laughs> it's good <laughs> um all right so to wrap it up here uh what advice would you give to people looking to get into career in data management? And data management is such a broad term. I mean, it can be anything from a you know database analyst to you know an analyst to a data governance uh, professional or anywhere in between, right? Data model or data architect. We've been talking about um, you know you know so pick one um, or one that you see that is you know maybe. Uh, you're either closest to or the one that you can give the most advice to, you know. Um, so what would you, what advice would you give? Yeah, sure. Um, I guess maybe I'll start off. So I, I think I'll, I'll approach this a little bit broadly and say that like, it kind of depends on wh like what it, where it is that you are in your career journey in terms of like, I think what's the best advice around getting into data. Like, I think that if you're already working at a company and you're not doing data, like you're, you know, you're in marketing or in sales or something like that, right? But you want to get more into data, then I think what's exciting is that this concept of the citizen data scientist has become much more of a thing mm -hmm. where, mm -hmm. you know, you can, you know, you know, check out some of the stuff at Dataversity, you know, go, go to Coursera, go to Udemy, get, get some, get some information, right. And pick up some skills around, you know, learn, learn a little bit of, uh, of Tableau or learn a little bit of, uh, you know, Python or something like that and, and get in touch with the folks in your organization that are doing data initiatives, um, and, and, and find a way to get involved, right? Be, being embedded in the business and knowing a business process puts you at a bigger advantage than you even realize when it comes to what your company needs around solving data problems, right? So I think if, if you're just in the business, this idea of getting involved yourself, you know, picking up some skills or even just partnering with the people that have those skills and getting involved can be a great thing. I think if you're actually trying to do a career shift in a more dramatic way, or maybe you're younger and you're going through school and you're thinking about what you can study and, and that sort of thing, I would say um, right, right now, this uh, sort of idea of the uh, analytics engineer is becoming really, really popular. Um, I think that it's at a really good intersection 
between sort of being able to understand the business semantics and things like that, like you've heard Juan kind of talking about around knowledge, but also having, you know, sort of skills around SQL, understanding around the warehouse, um, using frameworks like DBT. Um, I would say, you know, some of these skills around, you know, SQL, data warehousing, you know, being able to speak the business, those are great areas of investment for if you're, you're looking for like a career to get into data, you know, you can learn sort of this combination of, of a sort of more programming oriented skills and then more sort of business oriented skills that can be really effective. I love it. One. Uh, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm going to take it broadly to uh, for, for data management. I think um, data management is, if, if we look at it from as a, as a phenomenon, um, We've been studying this. We've been studying and addressing this phenomenon of data management from a technical perspective, right? It's, it's technology, and I, I truly believe that we have hit a wall. Um, whatever we're doing today is just a fancier version of what we did ten years ago, twenty years ago, thirty years ago. The problems that we described thirty years ago continue to be the same problems that we describe today. If that doesn't concern you, right? I, 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 I'm, it needs to be constrained. Otherwise, you're just living underneath a rock. So that means that there, we need to have a paradigm shift. And, and I think this paradigm shift is to start looking at this phenomenon of data management from a social technical perspective. And social means you got to talk to humans, understand the people, the process, not just the technology. We only focus on the technology. So that means that as technologists, what gets us out completely outside of our comfort zone because we don't like to talk to people. We want to <laughs> automate everything. So my advice is to get out of your comfort zone. Or I would actually argue that the winners here are the ones who are going to get out of their comfort zone. They're the ones who are going to go spend time talking to the business. And the other piece of advice is what I'm calling more business literacy. We, we've been talking for the last, what, 10 years or now about data literacy, which we definitely need. How about we start talking about business literacy? Let's get our data teams to understand how the business works. I mean, just generally, do you understand how the company makes money, the start to finish? The marketing campaign goes in, they spend money on these things, it generates leads, the leads go on through some pipeline, they go off to the sales pipeline, bring another, becomes a customer, customers can churn, they can go upgrade, or they can cross sell like that, money comes in, right? Can we understand that? So in what systems, what tools happen around this entire process of everything? Let's, under, let's understand what, how that business works. And that's literally getting on top of our comfort zone. I think that's why it's important to start tying more people with, with the business using it. And I think we focus, so because we focus so much on the technology, we focus, we, we kind of get disconnected from the social part, which means we disconnected from the true problems of that organization. We, we focus on the technical problems. Oh, I can't move this data, it's too slow or whatever. This data has no values and they're not supposed to be in here. Yeah. The business, the people at the end of the day who are running the business, who are making money and saving money, who are giving you that job and salary, like, what are their problems? And I, I ask people to go ask other people, of other non-technical people within with an organization is one simple question. What keeps you up at night? Just go start asking people, what keeps you up at night? What are the things that you're, that, 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 that are concerning? And like, and then actually, if, how is your technical data work contributing to that? indirectly, directly. And if you can't find the path of that, you should be worried, I think. Right? You should, you want, I mean, unless you really don't care, right? But if you really care and you want to have, I think you, it's important to have empathy. And that's another one is have empathy about the users, the folks who are actually struggling to kind of do other uh, within the business. Um, for a younger generation, I think we're now focusing so much on data science and ML, AI and automate everything we can. I'm like, yes, that is so great technology. Please don't forget about the knowledge. I, I mean, uh, we become data science. We can get a master's in data science in a year and you learn a bunch of big data and all that bloop and all that stuff. And you learn a bunch of machine learning. I'm like, well, wait, what, this stuff means things. Where is the modeling? Where is the knowledge around this? Where is the logic behind this? This is something critical that we, that we, that, that we need to start doing that we've lost. And I think also fun of, for leaders, we have, we need to go have this balance between efficiency and resilience. And we are being right now uh, uh, incentivized and promoted to go do things that focus on efficiency, short-term, one or two years. And that's why you hear CDOs change every two years. 
Yeah, because they're just incentivized to go do things very short. And, but we need to think about resiliency. It's like, how do I know that I am standing up a foundation that will live the test of time? If you're, and, th and this goes back right. to the executives to say, let's make sure that we're incentivizing these things. I mean, one of our, one of our customers is uh, Vopac. They're, they're, they're a Dutch company and there's the CIO, Leo Brand told me once says what? Vopac is a company who's existed for 400 years. As a CIO, I need to make sure that the company is gonna be ready for the next 400 years. That's resilience. Not everybody's thinking like that. Maybe not everyone needs to think like that, but let's start understanding that balance between efficiency and resilience and saying, hey, I'm saying, I'm focusing on something that's gonna work for the next two years. It's gonna work for afterwards. I don't know. Is that yeah. the best thing to go do? 400 <laughs> years? Mm. <laughs> 10 years, <laughs> even if you could think 10 years, 10 in years advance, yeah. man, that could be resiliency, right? <laughs> yeah. I, I think I'm always thinking the same thing for, you know, data diversity and all the other, and just in life, right. You know, what's it, what do I need this for in the future? What's it going to look like in the future? How do, what am I growing to be? I, I think it's um, important to think about the, the principles, right? Forget about the technology. Yeah. The companies around this. Think about the principles of, of, what, of, of what is being done. And a way to think about the principles is to go look at things like a like a, a box and what are the inputs and what are the outputs. You don't care what's happening inside that box. What are the inputs and what are the outputs? Those are the principles behind these things. Uh, and, and that's what we should start thinking about. And so it's because we just love to go, oh, let's open up that box and see the coolest th technologies in there. It's like, uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, the, the, the snowflake today and the warehouses of yesterday, it's still storage and compute, right? Different ways, but it's still storage and compute. Right. Uh, and I love it. I think you both have a really good, great message that uh, go be uncomfortable. It's okay to be uncomfortable. Don't avoid uncomfortable. Um, go, go explore, go try. Um, exactly. I think that's such an important message. Um, well, any, that's, I love it. This, that's all the questions that I have for you both. Uh, anything you want to wrap up with? And I know you got to, I love your URL. So you got to give a shout out to your URL because well, it's your company name, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah check out data.world uh, pretty yeah. easy to get to and and yeah. if you're curious to check out our podcast go to data.world slash podcasts and you can learn about catalog and cocktails yeah, yeah. It's so much fun Cat um, and cocktails an honest no bs non-salesy conversation about yeah. data so you like uh how tim and i have our conversations uh we do this live every wednesday at 4 p.m we've been doing it for 95 episodes we've had so many awesome guests and we always have uh, our favorite beverage in our hands so yeah we like to argue with cocktails <laughs> i love it and 4 p.m central right 4 p.m central, central yeah. live and then it hits all the podcasts all that stuff i uh, love that you guys do it live yeah <laughs> all right well Tim and Juan, it has been a pleasure. I really appreciate this. Uh, again, I love your passion. Very interesting careers, uh, very impressive careers. Um, uh, and, and thanks to all the listeners out there. And if you'd like to keep up to date on the latest podcasts and the latest data management education, you may go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Thanks all. Thanks so much for having us. Cheers. Thanks. Thank you for listening to Dataversity Talks brought to you by Dataversity. Subscribe to our newsletter for podcast updates and information about our free educational articles, blogs, and webinars at dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Mm -hmm.